to a special edition of Tuesdays with Melanie, The Comeback. Today we have two amazing people who have been working tirelessly in the background to track this terrible coronavirus that has created a pandemic around the world. We're broadcasting from the podcast to go studio at Stony Brook University, and this is sponsored by the School of Communication and Journalism and the Center for Excellence in Learning and Teaching. Here with me today is Professor in Chemistry, Carlos Simmerling, PhD, and Lucy Fallon, an artist, a scientist, and a PhD student. I'm Melanie Formosa, your host. Carlos, tell me a little bit about yourself and what you do here at Stony Brook. Uh, I'm a professor in chemistry, and I've been here now at Stony Brook for about 20 years, all of my professional career as an independent scientist. And I spend most of my time now uh, running my research lab. I uh, don't teach much anymore. I used to teach freshman chemistry for a long time. Uh, but now I just run my research lab. We have about 20 people in the group, lots of graduate students, undergraduates, and even high school students that work in the lab and do research. And we try to use computer modeling to solve problems in biology. So what does that mean? <laughs> computer, computer modeling. Well, so biology, um, you know, the, the molecules that make you up and the drugs that you would take if you are sick and things like that, they're very small. And so we can use experiments, things like microscopes and stuff that you use in, in biology and chemistry classes to get an idea of what's going on, but to really see individual molecules and how they behave and try to understand uh, what they do or how to stop them from doing what they do. We can't see that uh, in experiments. And so some experiments have gotten very good where we can look at molecules, uh, like at Brookhaven Lab, they do a lot of work. And, and so we can get an idea of what they look like but not how they move around and do their job. It would, it would be kind of like if you were trying to study people and the only way that you could catch them is when they're in bed asleep. And you'd think, wow, these are pretty boring. They don't really move around very much. I don't understand what they do when they go about their lives. And so what we do is take the information that we have from those experiments and then add in some, some physics and math and then run simulations on computers that we hope show us how they move around when they're doing their job. And those help us design experiments that then can go off and confirm whether the models are right or not. And you use this framework for COVID, right? And you won an award for it? Yes, that's right. We, uh, Congratulations. We've been working, <laughs> thank you. We've been working on um, COVID kind of since the beginning of the pandemic. We had uh, in March, right before the university shut down, we got together as a research group and talked about it. We had been asked if we could do some modeling work um, for Brookhaven Lab and a group that was working there. And so we talked about it and kind of thought about our skills and what this problem would need and ended up deciding that we thought this is something where we could help contribute to it. And so we've been working on it for about a year and a half. But it's actually, the, from a technical point of view, it's really similar to the things that we've been doing here for years already at Stony Brook. It's just that we hadn't worked specifically on coronaviruses. So let me, let me just get this straight. Lucy, you're an artist. So you created a visual of COVID, right? And then kind of brought in like the physics, the chemistry, the math, the art. The trouble in our work is trying to bridge it to, I guess, the public and make it kind of publicly accessible and usually pretty pictures and diagrams help out a lot with that because otherwise all of our data is just numbers. Lucy, explain to me what your visual is. So it's a picture of the virus, the coronavirus, binding to a human cell. So the virus is kind of like a human cell in that it has a membrane on the outside, which is sort of the blue part, and genetic material on the inside. And it needs to get its genetic material from the inside of its spherical body into the virus, into the cell. And what is the blue on the bottom? The blue on the bottom is the human cell. So the virus is the ball and that's kind of like bumbling around inside your lungs until it sort of bumps into a human cell on the bottom. And that kind of looks like the blue sort of ocean on the bottom of the image. And that has sticking out of it all these sort of purple proteins, which are sort of the keyholes that the virus needs to bump into if it wants to get inside. What's the difference between the purple, the blue, the green, the yellow? Yeah, so the blue part on the human cell and then on the virus is like the cell and viral membrane. So those are sort of just long membrane molecules that sort of protect the virus and the inside of the cell. Then 
the surface of those membranes will have proteins on them. The human cell on the bottom has those purple ones, and those are the proteins that the spike on the virus, these green things that are jutting out of it, have to physically bump into if they want to get inside of your cell. So the green has to bump into the purple. Exactly. In order for it to get into the cell and make you sick. Yeah. Okay. So the green is kind of like what Professor said earlier, the keys, right? And there are other things on the surface of the human cell that I don't really have visualized that wouldn't be the right keyhole, but the spike has to physically touch these purple ones because that's its specific keyhole that it's sort of evolved to interact with and infect you with. Oh, you see. Wow. And then, so these things that are floating around, what is that? So those would be okay. other viruses. Because whenever you get infected, it's not a single virus that makes it into your system and into your lungs and infects you. It's kind of a numbers game. It takes, you know, dozens or hundreds or thousands or millions of viral particles to get an actual infection and make you sick. Okay, so just a general, the, this is all the spike protein, right? This is a visual of the spike protein? The Spike protein is a single protein on the surface of the virus. And so that, it's one of the green ones. Exactly, yeah. Okay, so these are many, many spike proteins. Yeah, many spike proteins on a single viral virus. So the green spike protein has to bump into the purple Yep. in order f for it to penetrate the cell and get you sick. Exactly. That's kind of how it like unlocks the doors of your cell. And what's the pink? The pink on the virus? Yeah, well... On, yeah, so these are all sort of structural proteins for the virus, right? I said earlier that the virus is like this sort of ball of membrane with the spike protein sticking out and its genetic material on the inside. The um, Those pink ones on the surface of the sphere sort of help give the virus its shape and kind of morphology is what we call it. But it, the, but it can move around, right? And, and you said it can yeah. kind of squiggle and, and exactly. get, in, get in little nooks and crannies. Interesting. So is this, um, do people do this all over, creating this visual of, of the, or, or is this new? Did you just No, there's definitely a big sign, court of, or sort of scientific illustrator community that, you know, jumps on this and loves making pretty pictures of science things and helps getting it out to the public. I, um, have been using a lot of them for inspiration because they're a lot better and I have no form formal art training so like Real, I don't well, really know the color phenomenal. wheel. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Carlos can you describe yours? The, it look, almost looks like a peacock feather at least in, in my eye. Oh from the, the, red the virus. And, yes. So yeah that's kind of the same as uh, Lucy's here where the, the virus looks kind of like a ball and it has these spikes sticking out from the outside of it. It would be like you know if you had a soccer ball that was really pointy and you wouldn't want to kick it. Um, so there are about 20 of those each virus has sticking out because like Lucy said, it's going to bump into the human cell and it wants to find um, those molecules on the human cell so it knows that it's the right spot. And so it's got a couple of dozen of these things just to, to make sure that it has a good chance of finding something. And so in that animation that I showed you, we were just kind of rotating it to show how those spikes are all over the surface and then zooming in on one of them to look at it a little more closely. And, and so like Lucy said, uh, you know, uh, other people do visualization and graphics and things like this, but in ours, these computer models um, that we're showing in the nice picture, they, you know, the models have all of the details of all of the atoms and where they're moving and how they interact with other things. And so we have the nice pictures, but then we can also say, you know, there's some variant of the virus where the spike is a little bit different, which is one of the things that's different in the variants. And we can say, why does this particular variant behave differently? And so our, our physics and things like that that go into our computer models can help us explain not just what it looks like in a picture and help us get ideas, but um, more quantitatively how it does its job and uh, what might be different from one virus to another. Right. And looking at this, we can see from previous viruses, right? Figuring right. out what's different and, and what's the same, and then going forward, right, the SARS and... Right. So SARS and SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19, 
are very, very similar viruses. There's not much different about them. Um, but SARS-CoV-2 is clearly much worse for humans. It's more infectious. It seems to cause worse health, worse health problems. You know, it's a lot of things that are worse about it. And we're still, I think, learning as a scientific community uh, why that is, all of the things that are different in SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and MERS is similar. And then some coronaviruses, we get coronaviruses, you know, often that just give us a cold. They're not that dangerous. And so trying to figure out why it is that uh, a coronavirus that gives you a cold compared to a coronavirus that gives you COVID-19, how they actually differ. And ideally, is there a treatment that would get rid of both of them? You know, we'd like to find out, understand these viruses enough to know that, you know, it doesn't matter if it's SARS or MERS or COVID-19 or, or hopefully not some future coronavirus, um, but that we understand enough about how they all work to know what they have in common that we can fight against all of them. And that's something that we don't know right now. We just don't know enough about how they work to understand how their parts, um, you know, what they have in common that are vulnerabilities. So we have to keep researching because this isn't the first coronavirus, right? And it's not the last. We're going to have to really delve into this in order to find a solution. Right, I think so. And this coronavirus has spread so much across the world now that it continues to evolve. There are so many people that are infected that even with vaccines, this virus is still evolving and changing. And as it changes, it can start to overcome our previous immunity. And so I, I think that there's a very good chance that we'll just, you know, the vaccines are very effective. We'll get booster shots like we do with lots of other diseases and we'll all be fine. Um, but we also need to have in our toolkit an understanding of how they work so that that we're more prepared next time than we were this time. Mm. So tell me a little bit about about what what it looks like. It's it's red and white, right? If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it's red and white, and this is the molecule of the virus. This is a molecule on the virus, not the entire virus itself, but it's called the spike protein, and that's kind of this part of the virus that sort of juts out of its surface and kind of looks like a flower, depending on how you look at it, but. That was like the main target and area of interest for vaccine development. So there's a lot of focus being put on the spike and a lot of, I guess, reasons to make good pictures so that people knew what it looked like. So when we watch News 12 or, or any TV show, right, and you see in the corner that little thing going around, is that what, what we're talking about? Yeah, I think so. Kind of like the ball is the virus and then the spikes are the things that are sticking out of it. And exactly. you, you didn't create that right? That visual, but you've added to it? I've made my own kind of form of that visual. You know, every sort of scientific illustrator rushed to the scene once COVID became a pandemic to try and, you know, make visuals and put it out there into the public. And that was just my own iteration. And you're Carlos's student, yeah. right? Right. So, so you created more of like the chemistry and the biology behind it, and then you added the art to it? Yeah. <laughs> okay, and you said you had a team, right? That that worked together in this Gordon Bell Prize. That's right. well, we have a we have the team that's in our lab, but then the Gordon Bell Prize was actually shared between a few labs that we collaborate with, and so we have different labs that have different expertise, and we work together to build these models, and so we um, were nominated and submitted that together and won the award together. Can you describe how you? how you created the art behind it because as you learn more about COVID you added right to that visual yeah exactly um most of it was in sort of 3d modeling software that we use for a lot of our experiments that helps us sort of visualize all of these molecules kind of like what Dr. Simling was talking about earlier how you know we have snapshots of them from experiment that you know sometimes are missing things or don't really tell us the whole picture you know we don't usually get pictures of these things in cells they're in like beakers or crystals so it's in my mind important to take the pieces that we do know and kind of contextualize them in the area of actual like cellular biology so how did you visually add to that molecule the red and white flower oh man that was a lot of it was done in blender which is like a 3d visualization modeling software that people use for like architecture or interior design or it's very photorealistic and good at making really nice crisp pictures but so it's different it, than photoshop 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. It's more of like a 3D sculpting. Mm. So kind of like 3D printing, except it's not right here. Exactly, yeah. Okay. And I'm sure there are ways to integrate it with 3D printing, but mostly it was just taking different snippets of different experiments that we have, you know, the different pictures that they took from experiments and trying to piece those together to so, get... So, yeah. What does it look like now? The picture? Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> um, Very different than how it originally looked. We've learned a lot, so there's kind of a lot of added into it you know there are a whole bunch of different players involved with coronaviruses and how they infect you know human cells so as as more knowledge came out it would be less focused on like the actual virus or that flower thing on top of it and more on how it interacts with other cells in the human body i want to talk a little bit about the importance of making science more applicable to the general population right because we're not all scientists especially me, <laughs> and in order to understand what it is that you guys are doing in the lab, that's really important, right? And the Allen Alda Center here at Stony Brook kind of does that or teaches that. And I think the Alda Center is wonderful here because we've recognized that um, we can't just do good science. We have to explain to people why it matters and why they should you know, fit, invest in science and believe science. And so I think... Um, a lot of the, the issues with people not trusting science out in the community are because the scientists haven't done a good enough job trying to explain things in a way that don't use a lot of jargon and things that they don't understand and then just make them feel confused about it. Um, so we work hard to do that and the art is part of that where we try to show people you know, not all of the, you know, the complicated detail but just the general ideas of what's going on and why it matters. And the spike protein that we've been working on that's on the virus surface is kind of a good example of that because I, I don't remember a time in my life where a single molecule has been discussed publicly and, you know, with so much speculation and argument and so much as this in the past because the spike protein is what's the, the main component of all of the COVID vaccines. And so when people talk about one vaccine versus another, it's just different versions of the spike protein or different ways of getting your body to make the spike protein. So when you get a vaccine for COVID, you're getting uh, one way or another a genetic code that has your cells produce a little bit of the spike without the virus. And so it can't be infectious. It's not a virus, but your body gets to take a close look at it without you being sick and say, oh, let's, let's look at this molecule and develop some antibodies that will recognize it. And that's not fast. It takes a little while. And if you'd actually gotten the virus during that period of time, you'd get sick and eventually you could recover when your immune system catches up. Uh, but it's a way of giving your body that molecule and saying, do your best at recognizing this. So next time around, if you happen to get that virus in you, you're going to be ready to go. And so it's just about, you know, making that molecule available in your body. And then the different uh, variants of the virus that people talk about are usually different versions of that, maybe like, you know, different artistic renderings or something. There's, there's chemistry that's different in it, but the spike has changed a little bit and your body might recognize it differently and it might do its job a little bit differently. Um, and so we're trying to figure out how it works. I use the analogy a lot of, of cars that, you know, imagine you're trying to explain to somebody how to recognize a particular kind of car, um, that if you give them too much detail, then, um, you know, if, if the car is a different color or something like that, you wouldn't recognize it. But you need to understand how it works as a machine in order to be able to, you know, fix the car or stop the car from running. And so that's kind of what we've been doing a lot is taking the molecule and trying not to understand just what it looks like when you take a picture of it, which is what a lot of experiments do, but what are the parts inside that, that keep it running. And, you know, in the car analogy again, you know, how does the engine work? And if you don't, if you can't start the car, what might be wrong with it? And those are sort of the more um, functional things that we try to study and understand that can be really hard to get from pictures that you get from experiments. That spike protein that you were talking about, when a person gets infected with COVID, and I don't even know if that's the right terminology. Yes. Okay. They, the, the spike protein is within them? Well, so the spike protein is on the surface of the virus. There's, there's usually a typical virus will have about 20 or so spikes on the top of it. And you can think of them a little bit like keys where 
when it gets close to your cells, the human cells, there are other molecules that are your human protein molecules on the surface of the cell. And the spike will interact with one of them and it kind of uses that spike to unlock entry into the cell because the spike has its own genetic information and it wants to make, I'm sorry, the virus has its own genetic information and it wants to make more viruses, but it can't reproduce on its own. So it needs to get into your cell and give your cell its genetic information and say, make some viruses for me. And it's really good at doing that, but it needs to get inside your cell and your cells are pretty good at keeping things out. And so the spike is the trick that the virus uses to unlock the cell and get inside. And make you sick. And, and make you sick. Okay. Right. So you will eventually develop antibodies that will bind to that spike and stop it from doing its job. And um, so that's how you would become immune to it. The only way right now really is through either recovering and developing your own antibodies that bind the spike or getting a vaccine that helps you produce antibodies to the spike. Uh, but the spike is the key for it to get in. And then the rest of the virus does its job once it's inside. So the, the, the molecule that you created digitally, is that the spike protein? Yes. Okay. Right. And so we can see, you know, again, it's like a key. So it, you could look at a key and say, oh, look, there's some ridges and bumps and grooves and things like that. But what does it actually do? If someone just showed you a key, you wouldn't really have an idea. And so we're trying to figure out how this really complicated, flexible key that needs to sort of touch things and wrap around them and change shape, how that works. How does it actually work? It's not just a rigid key like the keys that we use. It's a complicated one, and we don't understand yet how it unlocks the cell. We just know that it does. Wow. It's so interesting to me because when I think of science or at least in school, right? I have a biology class, I have a chemistry class, I have an English class, right? Everything is separated, but it's really not in the in the real world, it seems like. I mean, everything is is one. It's all interdisciplinary interdis- and and connected. Like chem, bio, physics, math, right? Art, like it this whole project, it 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 draws from all of those fields. It does, and so it's nice to have a lot of collaborators here at Stony Brook, too, because you can't understand all of these things yourself. Mm. And so you need to have people, you know, we have kind of our our core things that we're good at, but there's a lot of times where we have to go to physicists and mathematicians and say, look, this has gone beyond our capabilities and we need help on it. And you're at the Lawfer Center, right? That's right, and the Lawfer Center is, is one kind of Uh, one of the research centers on campus, and I was giving a talk last week to some high school students that are in a summer program here and explaining to them that departments are about the teaching areas, like you were talking about chemistry, biology. You take together all the things in one specific area, science or humanities or something, and you say, here's a bunch of similar topics, and we're going to teach you the information about those. But solving problems isn't about one kind of information. It's about bringing together all these different areas. And so the research centers on campus tend to be um, people from lots of different departments that have similar problems they're trying to solve. And so in the Lawfare Center, we have people from applied mathematics and statistics. We have people from biomedical engineering, from chemistry, from physics, all these different areas, and we're trying to solve them together and work together because we don't have enough of those tools ourselves to do it alone. This is such a fascinating project and the award that that you won. Tell me a little bit about you, though. About me or about <laughs> Lucy? Yeah. I guess Lucy first. Um, I don't know how much there is to say. Um, I've been at Stony Brook with Dr. Simling now for six, five years? Five years. And then before that, I was over at um, Adelphi in Garden City. But um, yeah, you know, I... What? So you're a PhD student in chemistry? Yes. What made you want to go into that? Um, originally I wanted to do physics, but I had convinced myself that I wasn't good enough at math. So -hmm. chemistry was the close second. But, um, I don't know, I've always been very interested in science and, you know, cells and atoms and understanding things. I suppose I like the idea of humans progressing, and I feel like science is a nice objective measurement of that, regardless of, you know, the outcome or what the results are used for. It's nice to see. I like learning things. Mm, and it's pretty concrete, right? I don't know about that. <laughs> is that is that just some myth about science that it's so concrete and English is so up in the clouds? 
Um, I think so. You know, I think the more I learn, the more surprised I am how, you know, whenever you have two opposing like hypotheses or conclusions, it's very rarely a binary like is it A or B? It's usually some mixture of both. That's fascinating. I always thought science was black and white. I don't know. I mean, I think a lot of learning science is being fed very carefully timed lies and then being told that, no, that was actually a lie. Here is the truth. (laughs) But this truth is also a lie and the rabbit hole just keeps going down until you get to a point where no one is really certain and everyone has ideas, but the proof isn't quite there yet, I guess. After teaching freshman chemistry a long time, I have to say, I think that's right, that we we intentionally lie to you and it's not that we think students wouldn't understand the truth, but a lot of us that we don't even understand the real truth. And so it's like we were saying earlier about the artwork. We make models that we think help you understand the basic idea, even if we know those models aren't really correct, that they're close enough to the idea that they'll help you learn how things work, even though we know that they have limitations. And that's kind of how our computer modeling is too. We can't afford to do on the computer the kind of math and physics that we know would be right. It's just the computers aren't fast enough and biology is too complicated. And so we make a lot of simplifications. And then in the end, you hope that with all the simplifications, there's still something there that's about the essence of the system that you can learn from. Mm. Right. Carlos, tell me about you now. Uh, I guess uh, I would probably describe myself as, as a lifelong nerdy scientist. I was really interested in a kid and how things work and taking stuff apart. And um, I've always been fascinated with trying to, to figure out puzzles and problems. And so I wanted to be a chemist. I loved chemistry. And this was back when chemistry sets used to be lots of fun because they would you know, blow up and make smoke and do things like that. My parents bought me a chemistry set and I loved it. And so I, I went off and uh, did chemistry in high school and then got into college and was a chemistry major and then started doing the labs and felt like, you know, the, the chemistry set had gotten a little too dangerous for me. And I didn't like, you know, the, the concerns over safety and the fact that I would kind of feel a little bit dizzy and medicated after being in the lab. And, and so I got a little discouraged and didn't know what else to do besides science and chemistry. And so I just quit and thought, well, this isn't the right path for me and was out for eight years. And in the meantime, started working, I had to grow up and be an adult and, you know, pay my bills. And so I started working in a retail store and eventually ended up being a store manager in a company and realized that I wasn't going to get any farther in my career with just a high school diploma. And so I quit my job to go back and get a degree. I thought, well, a college degree is what you need to get you know, ahead. And chemistry, I've already got a lot of classes in it, so I'll just finish off this chemistry thing. But in the meantime, I'd gotten really interested in computers and learned computer programming. And the, the stores that I'd worked at were computer stores. And so one of the first things I did when I went back to school was to tell one of my TAs in my chemistry lab, I said, there's got to be a way I can just do this on the computer so I don't have to come into the lab. And he introduced me to the professor that ended up being my PhD advisor. And they said, yeah, you can do exactly that now. And so that was kind of the turning point for me is that I realized that all of my interest in sort of technology and computers could be applied to study these problems in chemistry. And then when I learned that biology was just big chemistry molecules, then I, then I was really hooked. There was no turning back. Uh, so that's what I've been doing. So you're, you're a computer scientist and a chemist. Well, I'd say I'm a chemist, and I try to know enough computer science to be able to get by uh, and to know when I'm in over my head and ask real computer scientists for help. <laughs> so one of the things we have at Stony Brook, another one of the great centers, is the Institute for Advanced Computational Science. And computational science sounds a lot like computer science, but... I think the difference is that we use the the computers as tools. I'm not trying to make new computers or make them faster or anything like that. I'm just saying there are problems in science that a computer is a good way to try to to learn more about it. And so that's what we do. It's just one of our tools. For us, the main tool, we don't actually do any wet lab experiments in our group. I guess your experience of dropping out of college helps you as a professor because maybe you, you, you can kind of connect with students and 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 understand their struggles. Yes, both from you know the point of view of, of not expecting people to be on this straight and narrow path, saying, well, you should have done it this way because that's what we all do. I know that life happens, and sometimes we have to be on different paths, and 
people need to be accommodating and you have to help people reach their goals even if things come up because they always do. We're all humans and things happen. Uh, so it's helped a lot with that. Um, and also I think, you know, I, I find myself very often looking back on that time and thinking that there are things that I need to do as a scientist that I never would have learned in any of my science classes that I learned when I was out. Um, because right now, for example, I'm running a research lab, which is like running a small business. I have salaries I have to pay. I've got to bring in money. We have budgets. We've got reports. We've got, you know, all of these things to do that aren't science. It's just that's part of running a research lab. And so being out and running a small business and having to do, you know, managing your team and hiring people and uh, all of these personnel things, all of that stuff is much easier because I have experience with it. And it was a retail store, so I had experience in sales, which is really handy when you're trying to get grants funded and need to go and explain to someone why they should invest a million dollars. You know, it's a sales pitch. And so there's, there's lots of things that I think people think of scientists as being, you know, in the lab doing experiments. But when you're running your own lab, there's a lot more business to it than you would have expected. So I think that's just a tip to students, at least to me, and I think a ton of students could, could agree with this, that everyone's saying, what do you want to be when you grow up, Right. Mm-hmm. What do you want to do? What do you want to be? But there's really, it's such a huge web, right, of all of these things that you could pull from your life. I mean, retail, did you ever think that the things that you learned in retail would, would help you now? I mean, everything, I think, leads to something else and, and helps you in the long run. Right. You're trying to create something in yourself that's unique and different from other people. You know, you interview for jobs or do whatever And, you know, again, it's a bit of a sales pitch. You're trying to sell them on you and you are unique and you need to have a set of skills and interests that makes you valuable and makes you able to to do things in life and hopefully still be happy at it. My father was um, an artist and had an art gallery. Uh, It was a small business, so I kind of grew up seeing what it was like to run a small business. But I was always, even as a kid, really proud of him for doing something that he loved and still being able to be successful and have a good life and raise his family. And so that's kind of what I, how I've always viewed success is that if you're happy with what you're doing and you can get by in life, that's, that's a win, you know, and it doesn't matter so much that you have some big plan that you're going to do something that sounds impressive or I don't know, even win awards or things like that. But for me, the, probably the most uh, rewarding part of my job is like you were saying earlier, the, the mentoring and being able to guide people through a period of their life where they're going from being, you know, undergraduate students and you have a major and you think, okay, I'm learning these classes. But then you have to say, well, the real world isn't about learning information. It's about solving problems and it's about being creative. And so helping them make that adjustment to using all the tools that they learned and finding their own path in life and discovering what they want to do with themselves, that's super rewarding. And so I I really love that. And that's why I'm in a university and not off working in some company. If people, well, first of all, what is it called? We didn't, we didn't say that. What is your, your protein spike called that you created? Well, we didn't create it other than our computer model, but that, that is what people call it. It's, it's just the, the, protein the spike, spike protein okay. on the virus or the S protein. Okay. Um, but yeah, the, I think they just, it looks like some kind of a ball with spikes sticking out of it. So from the first time that people were able to see fuzzy images of what this kind of virus, the coronaviruses, are called, they just called them spikes. Um, and they're called coronaviruses because the spikes sticking out of it make it look like a crown. And so their name coronavirus is because it looks like a crown and the spikes are on the surface. Like we talked about earlier, to go from what the computer gives you, which is, you know, a disk drive full of numbers and saying, you know, here are all these positions of atoms and things like that. There's not much you can look at. Um, you could, you know, maybe measure some distances or something, but you need this this insight because again problem solving is about creativity and so in order to engage your creativity looking at a bunch of numbers often isn't that helpful and so you need to be able to look at these images and then say okay now that I have this this kind of visual picture in my mind of how it works you can understand how it moves around it does its job and that helps you I think come up with ideas better than just looking at sets of numbers does and so we use the computers to do a lot of the modeling, but then the graphics to help us understand what it means and to, to make predictions. So it's really both. I think all of our computer modeling, if we didn't have good visualization to go with it, would be uh, hard to be creative. If people are interested in this and they want to learn more about 
your project? Is there any way that they can research it? Or is it kind of private at this point? No, definitely. We have um, a website for our lab that we keep updated pretty regularly. We um, post pretty much all of our videos there from our talks and conferences, and those vary from you know, extremely technical to more broader audience. So there's definitely ways to see what we're doing. A lot of it can be found on our website. And what is it? Do you Simmerlinglab.org, if I recall. Right. Okay. Okay. So go to Simmerlinglab.org. Thank you, Carlos. I, I hope I hope our listeners will understand that there's more to science than just the hard numbers. Right. I think that would be the that's the takeaway. <laughs> right. And that even chemists don't just sit around and do chemistry. That you know, I'm a I'm a big fan of a liberal arts education and always taking opportunities to invest in yourself. You never know when that, for example, that speech class that you took is going to end up being really important as a scientist, or maybe a science class ends up being important when you're studying history or things. You know, things are so much more connected. So you just have to be kind of a professional learner, which is how I consider us. We're not so much scientists, it's just that we're good at learning things, and it's just from practice, like being a musician, you have to practice a lot. And so we practice learning things. Wow. Well, that's a huge takeaway. Keep learning. Even if you're 100 years old, it's never too late to learn. Yeah. Definitely. Thank you both. That's it for today. Hang in there and keep smiling. I'm Melanie Formosa. Thank you.